this existence has passed through 84 happenings 84 times it has happened in this sense only 21 are still having a some kind of an existence 63 they're completely gone doesn't matter how you see but you can see them as memory imprints within your own system Eighty-four is a significant number today in our lives, whether we are aware of it or not. Why eighty-four is significant is, this existence has passed through eighty-four uh, happenings. Eighty-four times it has happened, this is the eighty-fourth time. Today, modern science proves that the whole existence is just vibration. It is not my invention, it is a scientific fact. Where there's a vibration, there has to be a sound. Yes? Is it okay? I'm trying to go logically step by step. There are other ways to go. Just with this, I can make you know it in a different way. But uh, we want to go step by step. Where there's a vibration, there is bound to be a sound, is that so? So, you are not just a vibration, you are a sound, a noise, rather. <laughs> those who are making the sounds and those who are not, all of you are just one piece of sound. This is what modern science is telling you. And somewhere way back, somebody told you, first there was a word and the word is God. Hmm? You know, they told you long time ago. A sound is a word, isn't it? A word is a sound rather. Right now if I say yes, because you know English language, you are attaching a certain meaning to it. If you did not know English language, as far as you are concerned, I am just making a sound, isn't it? Because you don't know their languages, you are thinking they are making some crazy noises. No, they are saying something. If I speak in a language that you do not know, you would naturally think I am making some crazy sounds, isn't it so? If I speak right now in Tamil or Kannada or Telugu or some other language that you do not know, you would think I am making some… You don't know whether I am really speaking a language or making up some nonsense, isn't it so? Yes. So a word is just a sound. So they said that word is God because anybody who has looked at the existence closely can see that what you call as creation and what you call as the creator cannot be separated. If you separate it, creation will cease to exist. Unless it's constantly supported by the source of creation, not for a moment can this creation process go on. Because creation is not a done thing, it is an ongoing thing. Yes? Are you an ongoing thing or you a done thing? I hope you are not a done thing. You are an ongoing process. Without the involvement of the source of creation, how would the creation be an ongoing process? It is constantly involved. It cannot be separated. So it is because of this, they said, uh, first there was word. That means 
from total unmanifest existence, when it began to manifest, the first thing that happened was sound. Even the scientists agree it was a big bang. A bang means a sound, right? <laughs> In India, it's very beautifully expressed. The first and only one god who existed in that part of the world was Rudra. Rudra literally means one who roars, a roarer. So why they called him Rudra is… that is the beginning of creation because it's a roar. The scientists call it a bang. Now, the scientists are withdrawing the bang theory that one big bang theory and they're saying there were series of bangs. So one very popular physicist right now who's written very popular books, recently he wrote a book, I didn't read this, I met him <laughs> He wrote a book called Endless Universe, yes, Endless Universe. Always science has believed that everything has a beginning and an end. Now physicists are talking about an endless universe. The yogic system has always been talking about an ever-expanding universe. For the first time, top-level physicists are beginning to recognize that there is no beginning and an end, it is an endless universe. It is a popular theory going on right now among the scientific community that universe may be endless. So when I was in conversation with him, I asked him, is it possible that it was not a bang but it was a roar, a continuous roar? He thought about it, he looked at many things and then he said, it's possible. Maybe it was not just a bang, it was a roar. It didn't happen in one instant, it roared for a certain length of time and slowly creation began to happen. So the first form, the first god was known as the roarer. Rudra means the roarer. So I asked how many times do you think he could have roared? He said, we cannot say. We cannot say because we have no way of knowing how many times, but obviously he's roared more than one time. Then I said, someday if your research takes you there, keep this as a guide point. He has roared eighty-four times. He asked, how do you know? On what basis are you saying? I said, by looking into my system, I am saying, creation has roared eighty-four times and it will roar further, many more times, a maxim maximum of one hundred and twelve times it will roar. When it roars the last time, then there will be no beginning and end, it will be a perpetual creation. That's too far. But I told him, you hold this eighty-four as some kind of a guidepost and you have machines and calcul mathematics, I didn't learn one plus one how much. You learned all those things, you work on this someday. Someday if you arrive at a number, you will arrive at this number, it will be eighty-four. How is this possible? he asked. I said, uh, see if you cut a tree today, People look into the rings of the tree and talk about in the last thousand years when a drought happened, when excessive rain happened, when a fire happened, everything, right? If you cut into this system with your awareness, the very history of this creation is written into this one. Eighty-four times the creation has rolled, we are in this eighty-fourth roar. What has happened as a result of that eighty-fourth roar? is where we are.
out of the eighty-four creations that have happened, eighty-three have happened, this one is happening. Out of these, as creation is happening, ongoing, the dissolution also is ongoing. So the dissolution process started for some creation and they started dissolving and dissolving and dissolving. Out of this, only twenty are still in the process of dissolving, in different levels of dissolving. The others are completely obliterated, except you can look at them in your awareness, looking at this creation because in some way it contains the residue or the experience of all that. Just as you carry your experience of life into everything that you do, the process of creation also has been carrying the experience of every creation into the next one and the next one, though they're completely different, though they may be completely different. Say, you went to school and played uh, soccer and uh, that was twenty-five years ago. Now suddenly it happened, you were forty-five years of age and uh, a burglar entered your house. When a burglar enters your house, you are not going like this, <laughs> you will go like this. <laughs> hmm? Because your soccer game, suddenly something that you have completely forgotten, somewhere it is there in your system, it pops up. You kick the burglar like a soccer ball, not like a, a karate kick or a calorie pie to kick or something else. So the experience, you might have played soccer just for a month, maybe three months, but that experience, somewhere the residue of that experience is still ingrained in you and it finds expression somewhere else in a completely unrelated space. This is the way you're growing all the time. This is what we're calling as karma. So this is the individual karma, what we're talking about. But there is a universal karma, there is a karma of the creation itself. Because creation itself is a karma, isn't it? The act of creation, is it not an act? Act means karma, it is a karma. The residue of that karma is always moving into the next phase of creation and the next level of creation. Like this, totally eighty-four creations have happened or eighty-three have happened, eighty-fourth is on. In that, the older ones have managed to completely dissolve, they only exist in terms of experiential imprint in the next one, but they don't have a living status. But the twenty behind this are still having different levels of living status. Some are become very, very wispy, some are little stronger, some are little stronger, some are almost real like this. They're almost like this, but they're in the process of dissolution. Their active process of creation is not happening, that's all dissolution means. See, right now what death means for you is, when you're a child, the number of new cells that you're producing if let's say in a year you're producing hundred billion cells, when you become thirty-five, it is dropped a little bit. When you become forty-five, it's dropped a little bit. When you become fifty-five, it's dropped further. When you become seventy-five, it's dropped further. A time comes when what you're producing and what is dying, what is dying is more than what you're able to replace. So this is how old age is happening. Exactly the same process is happening with the creation. The dissolution is always happening. Even here, dissolution is always happening, but new creation is happening, so it's vibrantly on. That new creation dwindled and stopped. So over a phase of time, over a period of time, this just went down. Only dissolution started happening and then after some time, only memory imprints are left. No living imprint is there. So in this, in this sense, only twenty-one are still having a… some kind of an existence. The other remaining uh, whatever, sixty-three, is it? Sixty-three, they're completely gone. You cannot see them anywhere, it doesn't matter how you see. 
but you can see them as memory imprints within your own system, because that imprint and that experience is still here. This one is a real thing, everything else in receding order, they're active. In this, there are two. In the current one, there are two. One is the physicality, which carries the memory of everything. Another is the source of creation, which is the basis of the future. Either you can let your past become the future, when you allow your past to become the future, we look at you and say, it's her karma. When we say it's her karma, what it means is, she's allowing her past to be her future. There is no fresh possibility in her, that's what it is. When we look at someone and say, karma, we are just saying, they are allowing their past to become their future, there is no future for them really, it will repeat itself. So when you say, I'm working on a spiritual path, what you're trying to say is on one level, the statement that you're making is that you do not want your past to repeat as future. You do not want your life to be cyclical, you want your life to go forward. You don't want to be part of the cycle. The last chant that you were singing just now is, Punarapi Jananam, Punarapi Maranam means this cycle, I want to break it somehow. Because once you get into a cycle, once you get into a circular moment, you are not going to go anywhere. If you say somebody is going in circles, what does the expression mean to you? It simply means he's not getting anywhere, isn't it? So when we say it's his karma, that's what we are saying, he's not going to get anywhere because on the circle, he thinks it's a new journey, it's a new journey because he has very short memory. Everybody is in a state of dementia. What is before his mother's womb or what is in his mother's womb also he does not remember. They are in a state of dementia, so the circle looks new. Every time they go through it, it looks new. They are like animals in a loop, you know, in a circus they put animals on the loop. This is just like that. In India, particularly in the yogic culture, I, probably it's there in somewhere in the… maybe it's in the Yoga Sutras itself, this example. They are compared to the bullocks at the oil mill. What they do to the bullocks in the oil mill is, they blind them, that means they blindfold them. They tie something over their eyes or they tie everything like this and just leave this. And it's on an oil mill, as far as the bullock is concerned, it thinks it's going somewhere. It's like you go on a treadmill, it feels like you're going somewhere, but you're not going anywhere. That is karma. So, this dimension that you're looking at right now is in two levels. One has happened, another is happening. So the eighty-three of them have happened. If you want to talk in numbers, the eighty-third one is happened but still happening. In a residual way, it is still happening. Your birth has happened. Is it happened? Your birth happened but still happening, isn't it? Your death also has happened but still happening. What I'm saying? Your death is a foregone conclusion, isn't it? It's already happened. The moment you were born, your death happened. First step towards your death happened, but still happening. You're waiting for it to be complete or you're wanting it to be delayed. But it is happening, isn't it? And it's already happened. So, there's another dimension within you for which the birth has not happened, nor will the death happen to it. Only if you touch that dimension, you have something called 
as a future, otherwise you have just karma. Karma means you are repeating your past as future. You may be changing the color, you may be changing the style of how you do it, but still the same stuff, nothing different. Same stuff what the caveman is, was doing, you are still doing the same stuff. Style and capability might have changed, but it's the same stuff, isn't it so? This is like anchor, this is an anchor. You thrown an anchor and you're trying to move your boat, at the most it can only go in circles, isn't it? So we are trying to pull in the anchor or cut the rope which holds us to the anchor so that next time we power, it will go away. So the whole spiritual sadhana is based on this, that you want to become free. Free does not mean you have to forget, but you have to become free from the memory which rules you. And the memory is not just in your mind, every cell in your body ca carries memory. This much is very clear to us through genetic science and other things. You are carrying the memory of your forefathers and you are still behaving like them, you are still having a nose like them, look at this. Unless you had a nose job done recently, yes? There are many, many symbols or there are many, many uh, aspects in the body which clearly say that the memory of these eighty-four creations are still there in your body. It is there in every atom in the existence. So what you're trying to cleanse is, you want to cleanse it from the memory because this memory binds you. This memory gives you a sense of belonging, at the same time this memory binds you, it doesn't let you go. So when you do sadhana, you're trying to cut everything because without cutting that, without cutting your anchor, you're not going to move ahead. So why this memory is holding me back? It is that memory which has given integrity and stability to your body and the structure of who you are right now. Without that, without this memory, this body couldn't be created. Without the memory of a single-celled animal being within you, without all that information being carried through the evolutionary process and you sitting here, without that memory, this body cannot be structured and held together. So memory is not your enemy, it is just that you don't know how to hold it. You are into it, that's a problem. You are into it, now you want to get out of it, you want to make use of the memory, but you want to… you don't want to be used by your memory. That is spiritual sadhana. You want to have a future which is different from your pasts. <laughs>